The views expressed on the following program are those of the hosts and guests and do not necessarily represent those of the Key Biscayne Independent. Portions of the following program were pre-recorded. And again and again I think of her I think of you Live from Key Biscayne, Florida, this is Antisocial, the radio show, podcast, and sometimes on YouTube show, where we look at social issues, news issues, and we try to at least have a little fun with them. Right, Tom? And they call me Mr. Fun. That's me, Tony. I'm, I'm fun with news. Is that right? No, you're, you're actually the news guy. I, I, just, I just make fun of the news. That's all I do. I'm here for comic relief. I feel... Uh, I feel a bit in awe in your presence. (laughs) Well, we are um, not so much in a state of awe, but we have a lot of things going on. Oh, my gosh. So in the news, it's like, you know, we had this momentary period where nationally and internationally things maybe (laughs) felt like they were slowing down for a half a week. Yeah, that was a dumb thought. That, that, um, That just disappeared. No, no, no. Now, now we're, you know, breakneck news cycle is every 15 minutes. Right, you know, we've got Russians colliding Russian their drone, planes yeah. into drones and yep. did you Chinese see the video balloons? on that yes i did it that was, was pretty amazing. awesome yeah pretty awesome yeah so i i i, I don't know uh, but our our topic today is a little bit more uh closer to uh miami and uh we're going to be talking about the criminal justice system um it uh is you know so tony in the criminal justice system yeah there are i forget the, how it goes there yeah. are two parts yes two distinct groups right yes mm-hmm. the police who, I don't know, investigate, investigate crime. the crimes. And then the attorneys who prosecute, prosecute the crimes, the, cr- the criminals. Like yeah. that, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. yeah. I didn't have it in front of me. You know I'm worthless without a script, no, right? No, I, I know. But, but we, 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 we try to, we, we did that whole bit. It's just like so a we redo from this. last week. <laughs> to redo from last week. Okay. You promised me, you promised me last week that we were going to have. Uh, and she's here. Really? Yes. The state attorney for Miami, Catherine Fernandez Rundle, is our really? guest. Wow. Yes, you you finally got her. Well, we had a little bit of a timing issue. Sometimes in law, that's called a continuance. So this is <laughs> no, a continuance. We're we back. had we had you we had you make a mistake on the schedule and tell me the well, wrong date. That, that's how continuances happen <laughs> because of mistakes. <laughs> at least sometimes. Ah. <laughs> All right. At least you came clean. Yes. Okay. But uh, our our guest is here with us, and she's joining us. Uh, live. Um, she is, in fact, the state attorney for Miami-Dade County, Catherine Fernandez-Rundle, and welcome to Antisocial. Uh, thank you so much, Tony and Tom, for this great opportunity to, to speak with you and your viewers. And yeah, I know this is the Antisocial podcast, but both of you are very social and very well respected. So I do want to thank you for giving me this opportunity to, to speak with you about really the unprecedented staffing crisis we are facing in Miami in particular, because of our inability to pay salaries sufficient to attract and retain prosecutors and staff. Uh, we're so, we know that you wow. had a job fair recently, right? That's a lead, right? Yeah. What is going on? Okay, so just like in the last year and a half or so, uh, your state attorney's office, remember, we're the prosecutors. We're the ones that are crime fighters in the courtroom. We're the one where the, you know, when the, when the police... Do, do the investigation like, like you were saying there, and we pick up the case. It's our job is to get it through the criminal justice system, get that ball down the field, right, to an end just result. Well, we have a couple of things that are happening at the same time. One is the salary increases that we've gotten are just not keeping up with inflation. And the cost of housing in Miami, as you know, is out of sight. It's skyrocketing every year. In fact, last year in February 2022, uh, we bypassed the most expensive then city, which was New York City, and we became the most expensive city in the United States 
and the 19th most expensive city in the world. So you take a, a low salary to start with. Starting salary is $60,000 for these uh, law students coming out of law school, most of them. And they have student debt upwards of 160000 depends on what school you went to, of course, and what undergraduate uh, debt you may have taken out. Uh, and then you get a low salary. You now have, can't really pay for your rent. Forget home ownership. That's, that train left the station a long time ago for most of the, or these new younger lawyers. And then you take that and you combine it with the loss of 250, Tony, 250 support staff, which is I'm going to kind of morph in a second wow. into your job fair. And then one other thing that you really have to consider into this really explosive situation, and that is COVID. So from COVID, you have a backlog of cases. You know, they'll say the courts were open, but they weren't, we were not trying cases. And so we were having some hearings and Zoom hearings but, and depositions, but that's not what moved cases. What moves cases is trying those cases. So what you have today, you have fewer lawyers. I told you I lost over 100 lawyers, right, in the last year or so. They have higher caseloads. And they, and they have more work to do because the lawyers have left and the support staff aren't there. Support staff are critical. They're essential workers. They're the ones that get the witnesses together. They work with the victims. They get the body-worn camera evidence. They get the DNA evidence. They collect it all. They give it to the lawyers. They, they're the ones that you know, organize the schedule for the victims and witnesses when to come in. Meanwhile, those lawyers are in court in the morning almost every every day our courtrooms are going with lawyers and one last thought um what's really you know not only is it not fair to these young lawyers that they're not getting the sort of trial experience that they deserve right because they came here they gave up money they understood there was going to be you know personal sacrifice that they were going to make to give to their community that's what they wanted to do and they're not getting that they're not getting that because they're being pushed along so quickly. So we have lawyers that are handling rape cases. That they're really not equipped. We haven't trained them. They haven't had the experience in previous trials because I mean, they're moving what so What you're fast. describing is just is absolutely frightening. Um, I just can't imagine the impacts. I mean, I, I cover, you know, stories in, obviously in our newspaper, and I know, that, I know I've seen plenty of backlogs. But what you're describing, these are major felonies yes. that it's having an impact on. Yeah, I mean, as a marketing guy, I, I listen to you talk, and you've done a very good job of telling me why I would never want to work with you guys. Mm -hmm. So take a minute and convince me why I should. Right. I mean, I, I mean, how you're, you're trying to you're appealing to folks to come and join your office. So how are you overcoming all of that? It's been very difficult. It's been very so. There's like anything else when you have a large challenge. I know you both know this, Tony and Tom. You have you have to have a lot of collateral strategies, right? And you can't put all your eggs in one basket. So we traditionally have had a very strong reputation in the country. We're the fourth largest prosecutor's office in the United States, which of course, and we have all these long-term relationships with criminal professors, with deans. And so over the years, we've been able to really recruit. But now, COVID, we didn't have, we weren't able to build those relationships because nobody was moving. Everything was on Zoom. There was no law school attendance, basically. And we weren't traveling to those law schools like we normally do. So we, we fortunately, we have some longitude, right? Some history that we can still rely on, but we got to step up our recruitment. And I will tell you, it's not necessarily about just the job because students still want, they want to come to these offices. And I'll give you an example. My chief assistant was at University of Florida, I think it was last week, recruiting, talking to professors, talking to students, talking about what we do as prosecutors. And a whole bunch of them, I think it was five or six of them, came up to me and said, I, that's what I want to do, but I can't come to Miami to do it. I'm going to go to, our, I think three of them are going to Orlando and the other two, I want to say Jacksonville or something like that. They were coming to Miami. It wasn't because of the office, it's because of the housing. They can't afford it. They can't yeah. afford it. They would love to come here. When you talk about diversity and cultural and fun and Key Biscayne and the beauty here, I mean, you're in Key Biscayne. 
I, w- I was at a Rotary Club today with Luis Aguirre at the Rusty Pelican. And as I stood up on that stage and I looked out at the bay, I said, oh my God, we live in paradise. Of course these students would love to come. But when they go online and they see that, you know, an 800 square foot apartment is going for over $3,000, I just talked to some developers about a studio, a studio that was 400, (coughs) excuse me, about 440 square feet, I think it was. It was, it was, it was like, $2,400, $2,500. $2,400, dollars So that's 85% of your paycheck that the legislature is giving us. So it's a, a challenge. Um, the last but not least, uh, my job is to make sure that I get the best warriors that I can for this community. So I'm off to Tallahassee. I'm const- I met with the chairman of appropriations, uh, Chairman Leak, I want to say two weeks ago, and we talked about this. And, and I want to be very clear. I'm not even thinking of competing with the private sector. Private law firms, oh my gosh, we're on fire right now as a community. So the private law firms are just bringing so much business in. And they steal some of our lawyers. I I know because my my wife is an attorney and they stole some. (laughs) Uh, Thanks. (laughs) Oh, they're excellent lawyers. It's your fault. (laughs) It's it's Tony's fault. Yeah. So come to conclusion. Nothing but compliments about about their experience there working for working for your office. But I mean, how does that work at the legislature? Is there a differential that can be applied to Miami Dade and Broward County, the urban areas where? The cost of living is just out of whack? You know, that's such a good question. I, I hope they're listening. So we believe there should be. There traditionally has not been for prosecutors and for other state employees. Um, I think Florida traditionally has looked down upon public servants, public sector. They haven't really kept up uh, <coughs> with the sort of salaries that they should be getting. But neither, to your point about cost to area differentials, um, I'll give you an example. One of my biggest competitors, other than your wife's law firm, Tony. <laughs> uh-huh. I'm in trouble now. <laughs> you are in trouble. I'm going to be. I'm going to set the investigators on finding out her name, oh, right. her law firm. <laughs> I'm, I'm okay. happy. To, I'm happy to testify. <laughs> I'm happy. <laughs> you can play the Law and Order theme now yeah, if you want, no. Tom. Okay. <laughs> there you go. All right. All right. Uh-huh. But. Um, so, you know, one of, we, so the U.S. Attorney's Office, great office, our good friends. Uh, right. They're the federal prosecutors primarily, right? So they automatically will give my lawyers, when they leave, 24% increase, the federal government will, to go to work at the U.S. Attorney's, Homeland Security, ICE, Immigration. And a lot of my lawyers have left for the 24% increase plus a salary increase. So you can just imagine they're probably leaving for about a 45 to 50% increase and what they're going to be able to take home. So we are going to the, we have asked Tallahassee in years past, the legislature, please understand Miami-Dade County. And like you said, you know, Key West is a very high cost of living. Um, You know, Broward and West Palm, we're part of the southern part of Florida that where our region is increasing in popularity. So we are asking them to do that for us. Do it for all state attorneys' office. But you got to keep in mind that Miami's number one. We love being number one on all kinds of things, right? Winning teams and and, and how, but not in the cost, livable wages compared to the cost of housing. <clears throat> so we're asking them to. Oh, and by the way, there is a president has been set. Both Florida Highway Patrol. And Florida Department of Law Enforcement agents presently get just an extra 5000 which is meager, but it's something, right? $5,000 extra if you're going to live in Miami-Dade County as a Florida Highway Patrol officer or a Florida Department of Law Enforcement agent, you're going to get that. Why, why shouldn't the prosecutors get the same thing? Hey, last question for you from me anyway. Um, We're going to take a break and come back yeah. with some additional Oh, we stuff. have more? She's going to stay with us? Yeah, yeah, just for oh, a second. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, then I, then I have a good question for you when you come back. Okay, we will take a short break, and we'll be back right after this. You promise? Okay.
And we are back on Antisocial. I'm Tom Mosloom. I'm Tony Winton. And joining us, our guest, Kathy Fernandez Rundle, who is talking to us about the high price of living in Miami and what the impact that has on getting people to the district attorney's office. Yeah. Can't get attorneys. So if, uh, Madam Attorney, if, if the problem is money for salaries, there has to be a solution. That money has to be somewhere. Where do you get it from? Well, right now, and Tony, thank you. I, I almost feel like your audience is going to think I like set you up for this. It's such a great exposure for us because, you know, the public really does need to know that their state attorney's office we're the only local state attorney's office for 35 police departments and other federal, state, and local law enforcement. So we're it, right? Um, they need to know that we need their help. We'll, we'll do our best, but at the state legislature, there are three things that we're asking for. One is we're asking for an 8.3 cost of living increase for everybody. We, I've been talking about lawyers. But, you know, you have a clerical person. You know what? They start at $31,000. Some, some, yeah, some, some of our support staff, unfortunately, would qualify for, for food stamps or other welfare. That's shameful. All right? And we're, we're asking them to, to do such heavy lifting for the office. So that's a very small, if you consider an 8.3% increase in just the cost of living, that's nowhere near what it's really truly gone up, but that's what we're asking. Number two, we're asking the legislature to give our prosecutors $15,000 increase, the lawyers. They're at 60. Don't, I've had a few, we got your wife on here. I don't mean to pick on your wife. She's a fabulous <laughs> lady. But if you would ask what the starting salaries are in any law firm, I happen to know from the law schools that what they're starting at 130, 150, 170, some yes. of them are too close. It's not, it's not close. It's, it's not, not even close. So, so $15,000 a starting salary in Miami-Dade County is $75,000. That is not, out of, that's not an unreasonable request whatsoever. And then last but not least is, is Tony, what we were just talking about, that area differential of the extra $5,000. We might be then, so that's right now, state legislature, it ends May 7th. The letters, emails, telephone calls, talk to your state reps, talk to your senators. You know, tell them that if you believe that these people that work every day to protect this community, um, to do everything they can to make us a safe community, to raise families, now's the time they need to hear from you. They need to hear that from you, not just well, from me. Well, li our listeners, uh, I can just tell you in terms of the way that people react to stories that we write in uh, uh, involving crime prosecution, and hopefully we'll have you on later. You can talk about uh, things that this community cares, uh, you know, specific issues this community cares about. But I do know it's a huge issue uh, to our listeners and uh, overwhelmingly in support of law enforcement. And obviously you're the other half of, you know, following up on, on, on what the job the police do. If I could, we have a few minutes left. If I could pivot to something different, um, another thing that you've been working on is changes to Florida's condominium law, mm -hmm. right? In the wake <laughs> of uh, whether well, you, you, there's some very high-profile things there, Surfside, of course, the grand jury report. Um, could you tell us a little bit about uh, what what changes you think are necessary? Um, I know some of them are. There's some changes pending in Tallahassee. What what do you think is important in terms of um, the rights and responsibilities of people who, who live in condos and the boards of administration that run these condos. You know, I'm so glad you, you, you asked me that, Tony, because that's a really critical issue that's pending right now also in the legislature. So those that live in either COA, you know, condominium, homeowners, condominium owners associations or homeowners associations, now's the time to weigh in. You know, and it's interesting. I use Key Biscayne as an example when I talk about the big hammocks case that we just we made arrests on recently because that one homeowner association is the same size as Key Biscayne and Miami Springs. So these are complete cities, really, that dictate what happens to you as a homeowner or a condominium homeowner every day, right? What the quality of your life is. So um, we also, one last thing, I don't know if you knew this, I've learned this since looking into this in Surfside and then the hammocks investigation we did, there are like approximately 22 million people live in Florida. 
and over half of those live in either condominium homeowners associations or in homeowner associations. That's over 10 million people. So it has a huge impact uh, for those folks. So what do we need? What we need is we need to have laws that have some teeth. So for instance, right now, there are a lot of homeowners that say, I just want to see what you're spending my money on, and I want to see that the bills were paid, and I want to see how much you spent and what the reserves are, right? Simple request. Now, before I go into the bad guys, there are a lot of honest, hardworking people on these homeowners, so they volunteer their time. But if, they, if you have some bad guys that are looking to scam homeowners to cheat and steal the money, um, that, you know, you, they're not going to give you the records. So what happens if they don't give you the records? Right now, under the law, the only thing you can do is file a lawsuit. And who's going to pay for that lawsuit? You are. So we're saying, no, 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 no. Get, put some teeth in it. Say that not, if you don't turn over a reasonable request for your homeowner's records, bills, invoices, costs, reserves, then that's a crime. And it should be, you know, after a reasonable request. The other thing is, Homeowners are constantly talking about kickbacks. And you and I hear kickbacks and we automatically think it's a crime, gotta be a crime. Well, if the president of an association or a home, you know, a property management company goes and wants to hire their husband slash son, daughter to do the landscaping, the painting, the fence, the security system, and they wanna get a kickback from that, you know what? That's not illegal in the state of Florida. Let's make that illegal. I mean, when I tell people that, they look at me and say, you're kidding. But that's my money. Yes, that's right. But it doesn't make and it. They, and they are, they are small governments. You use the example of Key Biscayne. We have the condo complexes here where uh, one in particular, it's 40% of the population yeah. lives there in one complex. Wow. Yeah. But, you know, how are you going to get these laws enacted when the largest law firms that represent the homeowners associations and condo associations are also the largest lobbying organizations in Tallahassee. It, and, and many of them are the largest donors to political campaigns. I mean, this just seems like sort of a, you know, it, it seems like an yes. uphill battle an when you consider, triangle. right. It, it seems like an yeah. uphill battle when you're, when you're, when you're looking at that. Well, so for me, I've had a lot of uphill battles, right? So I'm kind of used to just clawing my way through it. Fair enough. But, but I would give, but it's a good question, Tom, because we, we need help. You know, I always say we, we can't do this on our own. And so if you have listeners that want to know how to get involved, it's to reach out to their, again, right now, the leg, their legislators, they have reps. And you know what? Even the Council of Key Biscayne. They can reach out and say, you know, we, we, we want to, you know, they call us as a police department or they call us as council members or as the mayor. And I, I, I don't have any answers for them. This would be a time that they can actually, their voices can be heard. And last but not least, I would, to keep the faith, right, and to keep the hope alive, remember after Surfside, as horrible as it was, and maybe that's what it took, we did get some condominium changes some yep. laws and the condominium laws did change. And it did talk about, you, you know, reserves have to be kept. You can't kick that, you know, can down the road for the next one. You had to disclose what it was. You needed some expertise that board members had to take classes. So there were some things that were done, um, despite, I'm sure, which was a lot of challenges. And I think actually, if my memory serves me correctly, they actually called a special session after the regular session had ended to address that. So we just have to keep the faith. And, and one last thing I want to say, because I don't know how much time I have left, but, um, you know, Tony... The as much as you want. Oh, you okay. can take as much Please. time as you'd like. Right. No, Thank you so much. It's oral, it's oral argument and your time has been extended. Go ahead, oh. Woo, Thank you. <laughs> wow. Can you be my regular panel when I have to go? <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're, I'll we're look out. into that. All right, great. Now, now, now you, all right, your wife is saved, no problem. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but um, the one thing I did not talk about at all, Tony, was the issue of election laws. So... The, so those are three areas, the records, the kickbacks, I'm just trying to give you broad strokes, and then election laws. So 
for you and me and on your count on Key Biscayne and voting countywide, we have all kinds of rules and regulations, right? How we vote, when we can vote, when do we can do it, how to do it. Um, but did you know that there are no laws pertaining to any of these elections of board members? So that's crazy, right? And so whenever you've heard home, uh, homeowners want to change the board or they want to get somebody new in, oh my goodness, the struggles they go through. And in the hammocks, for instance, using that because that's already public and I can talk about it, when the homeowners that live there, there's, a, there's over 8,000 of them, I believe, they wanted to change their board. And so when it came time to the election process, the existing board members who we ended up finally charging with racketeering and fraud and theft and all of that, they actually shut down the election process. They started with, oh, your signature's not right, you can't vote, they tossed ballots, they hid ballots. And then when the police were called out to the scene, they actually shut it down and said, oh, we, we got to bump it, we got to shut down, and they shut down. Now, if that had happened in an election for the mayor of Key Biscayne or mayor of county or any municipality, what would we be doing? We'd be saying you're yeah. violating the law where well, there is no law. So we need to change the election laws. Tall, it's a tall order, and uh, we will be following that uh, as it moves through Tallahassee. There's a lot of things going on in Tallahassee at this very busy session. Um, but, you know, that's – we'll see how that package goes, and we'll let our uh, listeners know. Uh, Catherine Fernandez-Rundle, I want to thank you again thank for you. being our guest, and I hope we can have you back soon. Yeah, please come back. I, Lots I hope, to talk about. I hope you will invite me back. And I like that theme music now. Please remember next time to play the same theme music. <laughs> and thank you both for letting me uh, help with your audience and, and to help keep our, your audience and our community informed. God bless you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. And we will be back on Antisocial in a moment. And we are back live on Antisocial, a really interesting segment there. I'm Tony Winton. I'm Tom Mosloom. Yeah, she was uh, she was on fire, man. I was not expecting her to come out that strong. I thought she would, like, sort of couch the problem and talk about sunshine and roses. But uh, no, no, she came right out and well, said... Well, they're, 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 they're big issues, particularly on the on the staffing side. And I can say just just going through the pandemic and looking at these cases that just would sit there forever, we have a case... Uh, a really serious case that happened in Key Biscayne, uh, actually on the Rickenbacker Causeway. It's coming up on two and a half years since anything's happened in that case. Um, and, you know, part of it's the pandemic. Part of it are typical uh, things that happen in any criminal prosecution. But, you know, we're now two and a half years after a really serious case. This is a, this is a homicide we're talking about. And it's still grinding along. Yeah, but it's more than pandemic. I mean, the pandemic, well, yes, the pandemic had a, a profound impact on our area. But that impact on housing prices was happening before the pandemic, and it wasn't accelerated. It's accelerated because of development and lack of space. So, I mean, we know that there is a dearth of workforce housing. Right. That's why the governor has a bill going to Tallahassee that he's trying to get through. Right. And but but here Fortress Key Biscayne. <laughs> but, in, but in Key Biscayne, that is actually a huge uh, issue, and we wrote about that this week. This is our... Do you like what's that, going on do you in like the that segue? Segment. Yes. Did you like that? It was that, beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Seamless. Yes. Uh, well, yes. Uh, the uh, workforce housing, it passed the state Senate 40 to 0. Yes, of okay, course. Okay, in a highly polarized nation in a very highly polarized state, I would even still argue. Yes. 40-0 is a, is a statement of, yes, this is going to pass. Right. Uh, right. All, all of the Democrats right. voted for this. Correct. So it's a bipartisan... Both of them. Yes. I mean, <laughs> no, well, no, 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 it's you know a little I mean. more than that. But, <laughs> but even still, it, it, it has strong support, um, and it does a number of things, this bill. It's, a, it, it's about $1.5 billion over 10 years. 
it makes a lot of changes and incentives, tax credits, yes. to entice developers to build additional housing if some of it is designated as people Correct. For, for lower income. It's to try to alleviate the pressure here. The problem in Key Biscayne is that it would lead to density and it would override every state, every local regulation on zoning here. That's what the statute does. The local statutes don't matter. If a developer meets these criteria, you must approve it. That's the fear. Right. We don't know if that's the reality. Well, we know the that's the says. fear. We know yeah. that the bill might allow that. Right. But perhaps there are other ways that municipalities, not just this one, but other municipalities would have to control their own zoning to some degree. It's a... Uh, Unknown area until the final legislation comes out. I can tell you that the that uh, the mayor Joe Rasco wrote a letter to the two representatives uh, in Tallahassee for this area. One of them, by the way, is the prime sponsor, Alexis Kalatayud, who is a first term first term state senator. Sure. This is the, she, this is her this is her baby, um, and uh, they've written to try and see can you at least treat Key Biscayne like you treat the Florida a little, Keys. A little late now, right? Uh, it, it's going to be difficult. I think that's the, the consensus there. But this is this bill is going to uh, get passed. Yeah, of course it's going to get passed. Yeah. And then if Key Biscayne would like to challenge the impact in court, I think they're free to do that. But they would have to wait for a developer to come along and say, hey, I want to build workforce housing on Crandon Boulevard or whatever. Something we will watch. We have some other big news in the Key Biscayne Independent. Yes, addition, correct? Yes. We've, we've learned addition. Uh, well, in terms of adding to the staff, yes, we have. It's a and big I, moment. Yes, it is. And I, uh, we have uh, hired um, a, a terrific journalist to uh, work with us here, not just at the Key Biscayne Independent, but Miami Fourth Estate, which is the larger organization that's trying to build high-quality local reporting uh, town by town in Miami. Yeah, we're going to do this. We're going to mimic this. Uh, in in other news deserts. And the person that we've hired is joining us now. His name is John Pacenti. And John, welcome to Antisocial. Hello, all. Hey, John, how are you? Pretty good. Why the hell did you take this job? To work with Tony (laughs) Whitten again. Wow. (laughs) So you hired a lackey. Yeah, John... uh, (laughs) Hey John and I, John and I worked. At, uh, God, it was uh, going back to the Andrew era, right? Uh, that's when yep. you, that's when you joined the Associated Press. Uh, yes. Hurricane Andrew. That was a little after uh, then, and I had just started working. I'd been working for AP before then, but I moved to Miami in 1990. So we're it's like almost ancient ancient history <laughs> when you think about yeah, Hurricane a- Andrew. Yeah. I remember walking to the bureau. I think I came in on that December, and I mean, <laughs> you guys were burnt, burnt out, man. So I, so, to, I was new blood, right? So, so John, um, I'll just, uh, I, I will, I'm going to toot your horn a little bit. John has uh, obviously the experience at the Associated Press, but has also worked at the, the Palm Beach uh, Post. Uh, he has uh, won an Emmy for investigative journalism in the Palm Beaches. Um, he's a really solid journalist and is coming on board as executive editor. And John, just uh, why don't you share with us, you know, your passion for news? You and I talked about that last week. Uh, wh- uh, wh- how it, you know, how it drives you? Well, I just, I mean, I, I know, I, I really do feel that there's no small stories. That there is uh, news to be had in uh, every nook and cranny of a community. And that there are stories that still need to be told. And I have a great passion for that storytelling, whether it be investigative journalism and getting to, and even with investigative journalism, you want to see how the, the, you know, corruption or a situation is is impacting the readership, the the viewership, the people, Uh, or in, in the municipality where Every municipality that I've covered is like a little Peyton place, and there's a lot of intrigue and a lot of human drama that go that goes that goes on there. And I just find I'm, I kind of think I'm just a, a sociologist at heart. I just find it fascinating. I just find it all fascinating. 
I think you're going to be you need to be a psychologist here in Key Biscayne. <laughs> I think that's going to serve you far better than you, sociology. You you will need every discipline you can think of in covering Key Biscayne. There's we have a a raft <coughs> for a small community, and I, I've often thought this. There is such a, a wide range of issues, ranging from these uh, hot topic environmental issues of sea level rise, resiliency, sustainability. Um, we just talked about affordability and housing. Uh, there's a whole workforce here in Key Biscayne that commutes back and forth um, that is, you know, would be the beneficiaries of work of the very workforce housing bill that some of the key are fearing. So mm-hmm. there's there's a there's a tremendous mix of, uh, of uh, stories here. And we haven't even talked about the Rickenbacker Causeway or the Pelotons or or traffic or right. or crime. Right. Yeah. It's just it's a it's a very rich area. And I'm I'm uh, just want to welcome you to uh, the Key Biscayne Independent. You'll be starting soon, and you'll be seeing John's uh, byline. You'll be seeing him in the community, and uh, I want to welcome you aboard. John, when do you take Tony's place on this podcast? How soon do we get that done? (laughs) That would never happen. (laughs) But I'm excited, and, uh, you know, there's a lot of good... But the workforce housing, that was very interesting. I mean, if lawyers can't afford to live here, what about, I mean, teachers and landscapers and your people who no. you know serve you i mean where are they going to live yeah. i mean no it's, it's waiters te- waiters teachers first responders they all have to live in broward and uh when i was at wptv channel five in um in west palm beach we did a big series called priced out of paradise and i mean we found people who who were making money you know with jobs but they were still homeless they were living in their car I mean, it's 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 a bad situation right now. Well, <clears throat> these are the kind of stories that you'll be seeing in the in the months and weeks to come. And again, John Pacenti, thank you for joining us at Antisocial. And folks, you'll be hearing more of John in, in the as the year goes on. Welcome home, John. My pleasure. And we'll be back in just a moment. Whoops, that was the wrong button. That was close. <laughs> Bumble fingers over there. Right, indeed. It's got a cord there. (laughs) And we are back. On antisocial, it's my favorite part of the show. Why is it your favorite part of the show, Tom? Because it's not serious. Okay. <laughs> What's in your news feed, man? I don't know. We talked about at the beginning of the show. Uh, we got it's collisions, been crazy be- collisions, collisions between jets and and drones. <laughs> um, the uh, uh, possible indictment of the former president. Uh, you know, I haven't checked, checked my, that could happen right while we're <laughs> on the prime, air. Maybe <laughs> any minute now, you know, um, stormy Daniels testifying. Uh, um, <laughs> you know, it's just, just, uh, uh nothing's going to happen. And then a, a story I, I thought was really, uh, interesting, um, uh, that I, we, I want to pick up later about connected to all this political stuff is our governor, governor DeSantis, um, making a, a statement on Fox News that he didn't think yeah. that that the Ukraine defending <clears throat> Ukraine was a na- was a vital national interest or an exact term he it wasn't at the top of his his uh, national security priority. I keep waiting to I, I keep waiting to hear the walk back on that. Yeah, well, uh, it's funny. Marco Rubio was like you know had a quote I read today scratching his head a little bit like you know I don't really know what he was talking about. Yeah, you know, yeah, that kind no. of thing. I mean, well, my, you know, the right wingers on social media, the far right wingers are like, oh, Ukraine, the Nazis, they're all, have you heard this, this, this line of yes. nonsense? So uh, I posted and I have this question, like, if you actually believe that the Ukrainians are all Nazis, right? Like the, the Russian propaganda, we're going to denazify the country. Uh, you would imagine that you would be really behind this war. Where else can you spend some money to watch Nazis and communists kill each other? This this seems like a good deal to I, me. I don't understand. I don't. I don't understand it at all. Um, no, it's not. There, there's there's a there's a long history in American politics going back. Really, you can actually trace it back to George Washington about avoiding foreign entanglements and 
uh, you know, um, staying out, staying out of America first or stuff like that. That's a long, if that threaten, was, yeah. but that, that's not the line. No. If, if that was the line, if that was, uh, yeah, we shouldn't be in any wars, Rand Polish. Nah, okay. I could hear it, but oh no, no, they're bad people. They don't deserve it. That sounds like Russian propaganda to me. Yeah, that I, sounds nonsensical. I, I'm just, I find it just, uh, it, it was this kind of really strange and it was strange I thought for the governor to get out there with that position because it was different from the position that he had. It was it yeah. was not like a consistent <clears throat> position. It was a change in position. This is going to follow him through his run, right? Like they're going to because he's going to have to walk it back. Like what? Russia and China. What's more strategic to the United States right now than those two nations? And one being embroiled in a war, essentially a proxy war with but, NATO. But I, okay, but you're, okay, so this is where, we're, this is the, I think, the meat of our show. What was the conversation like in the room? There's a war room. He has aides. He has advisors. There's people who's do, doing There polling. wasn't one. Okay, are you telling me it's that unscripted and that unthought out? A, Every a once deci- in a while, a That candidate- was a decision to go on that show and say that. Maybe. Maybe it's a differentiator. Maybe they're looking at that audience. Maybe it's a Fox News thing. I don't know. Or maybe he just felt it on the set and he answered the question and his aides went, what? No way. So it's hard to know. I mean, I would like to think that that was going to happen and I'd like to think that it was the latter and that he's going to end up walking this back. So he's going to have to flip-flop on this issue at some point because his stance is nonsensical. I'm just, again, I always am fascinated about how, how, you know, what's that? I wish I had the bite from Hamilton. The, the room, room where, where it happened. happened. Okay, there's a room where this <laughs> this was thought out, but yeah. you're saying that it... Maybe the, not. The it, Maybe not. Because it didn't look, to me, to me. Okay. It doesn't, to me, it looks like he was asked the question and he... But it, what show was he on? I mean, he should have expected the question. Well, that's true. Yeah. But I don't, who knows? Right, he, okay. they sh- they should have expected the, the the question, and even if that's your position, he should have had a better way of phrasing it. He should have had a better answer than that. All right. Well, we've talked enough about that. What was because? On what do you think happens now? What do you think about the Russian disinformation machine now yeah. that they know that there's going to be a candidate for president who says that Ukraine is not in their strategic in- in- interest and it's a land dispute? Well, uh, 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 do you think they're not going to throw everything they can at him? Uh, and I, I don't know. To me, if you're looking. Is it a question of trying to stay as close to the Trump position as possible to hold on to the Trump voters? Oh, wait, I think I just figured it out. What? It was a uh, fundraising strategy. Okay. So now he's going to get all the Russian money. The oligarchs need to hide their money somewhere so it'll be in the (laughs) discount. Come on, walk with me down tinfoil hat lane. No, no, no. This is a good, that's a good line. This is, when, when you look at politics, you know, it's like, okay, your initial reaction is why? But usually there's some there's a strategy. It's trying to wedge people out or support, try to divide your opponent's supporters in some way, and tr- you're you're trying you're trying to uh, isolate somebody yeah. for some strategic reason. But when I, when you make up again, it was a pivot. It wasn't a, yeah. a consistent position. He had, it was a reversal. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, when you're angling, when you're when you're entering into a race, you want to figure out for your candidate what that candidate's lane is. Yeah. What differentiates that candidate from the other? And in this case, it's not the Democrats. You're trying to differentiate the Republican candidate, your... your, your Mike Pence. Yeah, from the other candidates who are going to be in the race. And you could Nikki predict... Haley. It's going to be Nikki Haley. It's going to be Donald Trump. It's going to be Mike Pence. You're probably going to have five or six more dive in before it's all said and done. Right. Right? Uh, so what's going to differ if all of them are... We need, to, we need to defend Ukraine. We need to fund them. We need to make sure that Russia loses this. We need to make sure that Russia is, certainly their military is degraded. We want to make sure that China sees a unified NATO so they don't think about going into Taiwan. If that's everybody else, then the naysayer voice would be, no, nah, we don't have to do that. Now everybody's going, wait, what? But you only do that with a candidate who's way behind in the polls and needs to have a, a really different position you don't do that with what would arguably be one of the two front runners yeah i mean the the candidate who i was expecting to say that would be this one i can no longer remain (laughs) in today's democratic party that's under the complete control of an elitist cabal of warmongers who were driven by cowardly wokeness okay sorry we have to work that in so i love that line 
You can't. Uh, we should do a whole show where that's. We just do I, that. Maybe we should invite her on. Maybe can we do a fake on. interview with her? No. <laughs> where do fake interview. We just we we'll just interview, play interview we just, Congresswoman Gabbard if she. I don't know. Maybe she, maybe. Let's do it. Let's try it. We'll try it. Miss, Miss Gabbard, um, I understand that you've left the Democratic Party. What was your main reason for leaving the Democratic we, 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 Party? We know why. She said so. <laughs> I just want to hear the sound bite again. <laughs> but, but from your words. Yeah. Anyway, what, uh, we're running out of time. Did you have a, a good a good uh, item for your feed? Well, I will tell you that if you'll recall last week at the end of the show, I told you I was going to go out to Carl Gables to Pont Circle, and I was going to see the moon. Oh, right. Yes. Uh, so it is a 27-foot wide diameter art installation of the moon using NASA imagery. So it's hyper accurate. Some awesome photos. And it's, and yeah. it's about, you know, 20 feet off the ground. So it's right on top. It is spectacular. And you, how long is it there till? It's uh, this weekend and next weekend. Thursday, so, Friday, Saturday. Thursday, Friday, Saturday. You got two weekends to go see it. You really should. It's, it's, it's super phenomenal. All right, everybody. Don't miss out on it because once it's gone. The moon will have set. Exactly. <laughs> That's our show for this week. All right, guys. Uh, thank you for joining us. Thank you to Catherine Fernandez Rundle. She was an awesome guest, and welcome aboard, John. For Antisocial, I'm Tom Mosloom. I'm Tony Winton. Be safe, everyone. And again and again, I think I will have.